The China Global South podcast is supported in part by the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg and by our subscribers. Thank you. If you'd like to subscribe for daily news and exclusive analysis about every aspect of China's engagement in Africa, Asia, and throughout the developing world, go to chinaglobalsouth.com forward slash subscribe. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China Global South podcast. I'm Eric Olander in Ho Chi Minh City, and as always, I'm joined by China Global South's managing editor, Kobus van Staden in Berlin, Germany. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, it has been a truly exhausting past few days. I mean, the news this week has just been unreal. And I, I apologize to our newsletter subscribers because today's edition was just 45 kilometers long because there's so much going on. Let me just bring everybody up to speed in case you haven't been paying attention. There was a huge summit in New Delhi of G20 leaders. Chinese President Xi Jinping did not show up at that. He sent his prime minister, Li Qiang, instead. Also, Li went to the ASEAN summit in Jakarta. She was a no-show there as well. Over the weekend, we also saw another rather scary confrontation between the Philippines and China in a showdown in the South China Sea. Lots of video of that, a very tense situation. Earlier last week, tensions roiled throughout Asia when China released a new standard map that got a lot of people also upset over the way that China delineated its borders. On Friday of last week, Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro, he arrived in China. And then on Sunday, Zambian President Haikin de Hishilema arrived in Shenzhen, to kick off a six-day tour that will culminate in Beijing with a meeting with Xi Jinping. For those of you who follow the China-Africa discussion, this meeting between Hishilema and Xi and the visit is incredibly important given the fact that they need to finalize the debt restructuring deal that they agreed to back in June. And Hishilema needs to get this whole issue beyond him so that he can start focusing on his re-election campaign for an election that is still three years away But he's got to start delivering things and get the debt issue behind him. And then here in Vietnam on Sunday, U.S. President Joe Biden came to town. He was up in Hanoi and he upgraded diplomatic ties with Vietnam to the highest level on par with China. Now, China said it doesn't mind if Vietnam manages its own diplomatic ties. We don't interfere in the internal affairs of other countries. That is the standard line that China uses. But boy, oh boy, there was a lot of anxiety about the Biden visit to Vietnam expressed in the Global Times newspaper. And then something very interesting happened over the weekend. Trucks carrying durian and fruit and all sorts of produce from Vietnam into China mysteriously had to undergo extra sanitary inspections. And so hundreds of trucks were blocked up on the border, the northern border with China. And a lot of people are thinking that, well... There's really no such thing as a coincidence in this world. So the timing of all of a sudden these new inspections with the upgrading of ties just points to the fact, Cobus, that there is so much that's going on. And then last week, to cap all of this off, was the 10th anniversary of China's Belt and Road Initiative. So try and picture this. Back on September 7th, 2013, at Nazarbayev University in Kazakhstan, a relatively new Chinese president by the name of none other than Xi Jinping made the first reference of what would later become the Belt and Road Initiative. To forge closer economic ties, deepen cooperation, and expand development in the Euro-Asia region, we should take an innovative approach and jointly build an economic belt along the Silk Road. This will be a great undertaking, benefiting the people of all countries along the route. Kobus, that was a rather modest beginning for what would later become a truly transformative initiative. I mean, it's funny to think about that speech today because back then no one really could have imagined what it would later become. Just consider the announcements this past weekend in New Delhi where the U.S. and the European Union unveiled a massive India-Mideast-Europe transport corridor, and they are also pushing forward with the development of the Lobito Railway Corridor in Angola, the DRC, 
and Zambia. Cobus, I think it's 100% fair to say that neither one of those would ever have been considered without the BRI. Yes, I also think so. There would have been no need to kind of spend the political and other capital it's going to take to to make those happen. I mean, once we still have to see whether that would actually happen, but still, I think uh, the Belt and Road Initiative has been transformational in the sense of not only putting all the capital out there to make all these things happen, but also in, in the way that kind of political will and capital ended up kind of working together. And in some ways, I think really transformationally. Well, we're going to talk about the situation here in Southeast Asia today, and we're going to touch on the BRI, but we're specifically going to focus on Cambodia. And this is a country that we don't often target for discussion because it's relatively small. It's one of the poorest countries in Asia, but it's becoming increasingly important and has a lot of lessons that we can learn from in terms of Chinese development engagement. Before we get into that, let me just give you a little bit of background on Cambodia, because I know a lot of folks outside of Southeast Asia may not be familiar with the country. Now, it's a country that's been run by one man for the past 40 years or so, since the end of the war in the 70s. Hun Sen, he came out of the Khmer Rouge, and he stepped down last month and handed power to his son, Hun Manet, who until now was the powerful head of the Cambodian army. Although it's one of Southeast Asia's fastest growing economies with a growth rate this year projected somewhere around 5.8%, and when you consider that in the current global economic environment that we're in, almost 6% growth is very, very impressive. Nonetheless, it's also one of the region's poorest countries with a per capita income of just about $1,800 a year, That comes out to be about $5 a day. And this is in part why ties with China are so really very, very important. China is Cambodia's largest trading partner with two-way trade somewhere at around $16 billion. It's also the largest source of foreign investment. Last year, China alone accounted for about 40% of Cambodia's $4 billion of FDI. It's Cambodia's largest aid donor and the number one source of development finance. And it's that last item on the list that in many ways is the most important. Cambodia faces a $28 billion infrastructure deficit, which not surprisingly, this is where the Chinese are playing a very important role. And for those of you who've been following our discussions about Chinese infrastructure development in Africa, you will recognize a lot of what's going on in Cambodia. The Chinese are using interest-free grants to build roads. There's a lot of low-interest concessional lending going on. And now, more and more, we're starting to see large-scale public-private partnerships, including a new $1.6 billion highway that will connect the Cambodian capital, Phnom Penh, with where I'm at here in Ho Chi Minh City, 138 kilometers away. And that's going to be very exciting for us living in Ho Chi Minh City who want to go to Phnom Penh very easily right now. More or less, you still got to fly. The roads are not great. And earlier this year, the Cambodians launched a $2 billion expressway known as the Phnom Penh Sihanoukville Expressway. Now, both these two expressways are built by the China Road and Bridge Corporation. And if that name sounds familiar to you, it's because that's the same company that built the Nairobi Expressway and also the Standard Gauge Railway, and they are active around the world And I always like to remind my friends in Kenya that if they don't like the $2 toll on the Nairobi Expressway, and if they think that's expensive, they should be very happy that they don't live in Cambodia, where the Phnom Penh Sihanoukville Expressway costs $12 to use each time. So let's get a perspective now on what's going on in Cambodia and the question of Chinese engagement in the infrastructure space from two scholars who recently wrote a paper Uh, that was published just last month, in fact, Chinese Capital, Regulatory Strength and the BRI, A Tale of Fractured Development in Cambodia. That was published in the academic journal World Development, and it was written by Yuan Wang, who's an assistant professor of international relations at Duke Quenshan University in Jiangsu province, and Linda Calabrese, who is a research fellow in the International Development Program at the Overseas Development Institute, or ODI, in London. Yuan, Linda... Wonderful to have you on the show. Thank you, Eric. Hi. Thank you, Eric. 
Linda, let's start with you. It's interesting that both you and Yuan have uh, backgrounds in China-Africa development. Linda, you've been on the show with us before. What inspired you to focus on the situation in Cambodia in particular? So, well, I'm a development person by background, right? So my interest is in Africa as a development setting, but also in Global South, more in general. And I'm very interested in studying Global China. So not for in China, after for the first, so China and Southeast Asia, I've done some work recently on China, Central Asia. Cambodia in particular is a very interesting case. I mean, exactly because of what we have written in this study about the differences that you see in how Chinese capital is deployed in the country and the impact it has. And so we thought it's a very good case to show the fact that, uh, you know, it, the impact of Chinese capital is not so linear. And then, yeah, so we work with UN uh, where we have collaborated sort of dividing the work along linguistic lines in a way. I've done more the sort of English side of the work and she's done more, she's focused more on the Chinese side of the work. I must say also that this work is based on some previous reports that we have done at ODI. So at ODI, we have worked on the risks of the Belt and Road Initiative in several countries. One was Cambodia, and that's where you know, we started with the idea for this academic journal article. Yuan, the study focused on two very different kinds of capital and different kinds of investments. So I was wondering how you chose that and, and you know, kind of what was the thinking in, in the structuring of the paper in that way? It's more based on our intuitive observation of Chinese companies in Cambodia. We just saw that there was such difference in company corporate behaviors. So there is the state-owned companies or state capitals, Chinese state capitals, that they had this put, uh, political requirements together with their importance of achieving a profit. But there is also this short-term profit-driven Chinese capital, particularly in the gambling sector, that they just don't think beyond five years, sort of, and uh, focusing on making a profit with zero political requirements behind them. So we saw those practice differences behind of these two types of capitals, and then we're just trying to make sense of them uh, by giving them different types. Yeah, so Yuan, you talked about the role of short-term Chinese capital in the gambling sector. Does that also apply to other private sector enterprises that the Chinese are in and other sectors beyond just gambling, or is this something unique to the gambling space? Yeah, we do see that also in other types of sectors, but gambling is the sort of the denis of um, the short term and profit driven. And that's why we chose it as an example. We also see real estate companies that were not as regulated and also in Chinese private firms also exist in manufacturing companies sector, but they also contribute to local developmental goals. So it's like a spectrum of Chinese capitals and yeah. Linda, if you have anything to add on that. Sure. I mean, I think we can say that, you know, if we look at this short-term orientation, I mean, capital and money that flows into the gambling sector is very particular and very often is linked to, you know, transnational crime networks as well. We see a lot of that in Sihanoukville. We haven't really explored that into this article, but this Chinese capital has been accompanied with a lot of rising crime in the region, right? So fighting and kidnapping and gun shooting and so on and so forth. Now, we know that in the rest of Southeast Asia, this money going in gambling that's linked to sort of crime networks. There's a lot of research done on Myanmar, for example. We haven't really gone to look into much detail, but the fact remains that this sort of short-term orientation of using the money for very quick purposes and coming back very quickly is really linked to the type of money that is poured in the gambling sector. In other sectors, we also see profit-driven capital, so in real estate, for example, but it, or in manufacturing, of course, there's also a need there to turn a profit when you invest some money. But it's not the same. It's not that quick money where you want to obtain money out of it and maybe, you know, even leave quickly, even leave the country quickly. This is very specific to the gambling sector, at least in, in the Cambodian case. And Linda, one of the big points made in the paper is, is about the, the importance of regulatory oversight and that a lot of, a lot of the kind of good outcomes and bad outcomes had to do with kind of regulatory strength. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the different kinds of regulation that's happening in these different sectors. Sure. I mean, that's really the point that we wanted to emphasize, right? There's a lot of interest in what type of Chinese money is going into this country. Is it private? Is it state? Uh, Qin Quan Li has a more sophisticated approach of, of varieties of capital that we draw from for the paper, where she looks at what interest the capital serves. So does it serve the state uh, interest or the private interest and so on and so forth? 
But what we also wanted to emphasize is that it's not only the Chinese side that determines the outcome, but it's also the host country side. And in particular in Cambodia, we see vast differences if we look at different sectors. Now, if we look at infrastructure that's very well regulated in the sense that it's, of course, a sector of national prominence, it's very key for the government, it's mentioned in all the national planning strategies and papers and visions for the country, but it's also one where there's been a lot of emphasis on, you know, anti-corruption and meritocracy and so on and so forth. The minister that's in charge of the sector is someone who was educated abroad and worked abroad. He has very good international exposure. And he's really someone who has spreaded Cambodia's anti-corruption campaign. So what we see really is that the sector is well regulated. It has a strict oversight. And therefore, you see positive outcomes in the sense that you see roads being built and revamped in Cambodia. On the other hand, the gambling sector is situated in the city of Sihanoukville, which is, you know, always described as a once sleepy coastal town. And now, you know, you have all of this money flowing in and there's a lot of activity happening there. And the reality is that that activity is controlled or or sort of managed by the local government, which doesn't nearly have the same level of power as the central government, even though Cambodia has undergone through a lot of decentralization in the sense that power should be handed over to the local government. This hasn't really happened yet that much. Money has not been flowing towards the local government. And so you find that you have this local government that's supposed to promote the interests of Sihanoukville's, the citizens of the city and of the province, but they don't really have the means to do that and they don't really have the ability to control this massive inflow of capital coming in. And that's why we say they have a lower regulatory strength and therefore in conjunction with the type of capital that they receive, the outcome is close to disastrous. And that's why we talk about structural development. And Linda, this question of why can't the national government assert itself over the local government in Sihanoukville? And this is a dynamic that we see in many developing countries, say in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where Kinshasa's ability to influence outcomes in a place like Lumbumbashi very far away is quite limited. So there's some interesting parallels there. But what did your research tell you about whether Phnom Penh and those very competent officials and their inability to, say, exert influence over the less competent or more greedy or, you know, more corrupt officials in Sihanoukville? I mean, there are a few examples. There are a few cases in which the national government does that. So a few years back, for example, one of the main complaints in Sihanoukville, for example, is that Cambodians do not get job opportunities or do not get business opportunities. They're all taken by the Chinese. So a few years back, the central government issued a PRACA regulation saying that there are some jobs that foreigners cannot do. Foreigners cannot be hairdressers or taxi drivers. You know, you need Cambodians to do those jobs because they are able to do those. It's not a question of skills, really. Or more recently, for example, in response to the rising crime in Sihanoukville, the government actually came in and regulated online gambling, prohibiting online gambling. Sihanoukville, a lot of the gambling investment there is not for gambling on site, but it's online gambling websites that are then accessed by people mostly back in China. So the central government sometimes steps in and says, you know, this shouldn't be like this and we we are going to regulate that. But then you still need someone to monitor the regulations and to enforce them on the ground. And that's generally left with the local government. And so there's limitations to what they can do. I mean, it's even in a case of Sihanoukville, it's even very difficult to know how many foreigners live there how much money has been invested in a specific industry, right? So the local government already doesn't really know what is happening. They don't have the means to find out. So monitoring that and regulating what happens is even more complicated. Yuen, one of the other points made in the article is, as Linda was alluding to now, the difficulties of making sure that all of this Chinese capital flowing into Sihanoukville actually creates jobs for Cambodians. And uh, the article sh- makes the point that there is this, what, what you call a kind of a Chinese silo that, that, that developed there. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that and like, what does that mean and how, and how does it actually work? Yeah, so in terms of job creation, we do see that there's variations in terms of some Chinese companies hire local individuals. And we heard that there is this one Chinese or one foreigner should at least be paired with 10 locals from one interview. But uh, we also saw in other interviews that there are uh, Chinese companies that just simply do not apply these rules to themselves or not even aware of these rules. So on this, we do see the regulatory differences in different cities and in different sectors. On the Chinese silo, there are so many Chinese companies and Chinese economic activities being 
Let's see how the bill in Cambodia in general, that especially in Siap the bill, we found that this allows many Chinese companies and people and businesses to simply make their living and thrive by working with Chinese. There are language barriers and uh, they saw uh, Cambodia as a short term destination to make money and send money back to home. Um, so they don't sometimes bother to uh, engage with locals as much as they should. So, yeah. And that's what we observe at the Chinese final. So, Yuan, when a lot of people see Chinese companies in many countries, Cambodia being a good example here, not behaving well, investing in gambling and prostitution and other criminal activities, the question comes up, does the Chinese government or the Chinese embassy in that country ever have any authority or jurisdiction to be able to regulate the behavior of Chinese enterprises that are investing in these, what you guys define in the paper as short-term investments, these under five-year quick turnaround investments. Is there anything that can be done on the governance side from the Chinese side rather than on the Cambodian side? We sort of didn't ask the Chinese embassy of this question, unfortunately, but they are Chinese companies and then they are subject to also the regulation of some Chinese regulations back home and from the Chinese embassy. But the issue is, the time I visited the Chinese embassy and Chinese economic consulates in, in Cambodia back in 2018, 2019, they were seriously short of stuff in regulating maybe six or seven back then, and then regulating such huge volume of Chinese companies. And especially these are private owned enterprises. They might just come, individuals, migrants come to Cambodia and uh, register a company there. Do you call them a Chinese company or you call them just company, local company, a foreign company? So uh, the line between like where to regulate and how to regulate them is just sort of difficult to draw. Linda, from a China-Africa perspective, there's been so much discussion in the China-Africa space around African agency, you know, in dealing with Chinese capital, in dealing with Chinese government power, and then, you know, using that as a kind of a platform from which to look at why some Chinese investments in Africa don't necessarily have the development impacts that people want them to have. So I was wondering, from having worked in both China, Cambodia, and, and, and uh, you know, kind of China-Africa context, how that shook out on the Cambodian side, and like, what were some of the parallels and differences in the similar kind of conversations happening on the China-Africa side from your perspective? Mm, sure. So what we try to demonstrate here is we try to look at, you know, what the government says that they want to achieve and whether they achieve it or not. And in the case of the road network, so we're looking at a sector under the oversight of the national government, we demonstrate that the Cambodian government is actually really effective at achieving that. So if we talk about agency, it's actually really great. And we must stress the contribution here, the capital that goes in the sector is not only Chinese capital. Of course, Chinese is the largest financier of Chinese of uh, Cambodian road networks, but there's also a lot of others, Japan, South Korea, Asian Development Bank, and so on and so forth. So the Cambodian government is really able to take all of this money and to sort of turn it into something that is beneficial for their own government agenda, of course, for the Cambodian people as well, but they also fulfill what they promised they would do, right? So they really showcase great agency in doing that because they managed to leverage different capital from different sources and from different sides. And I think it's interesting to compare this with the African case where, you know, I can only speak really for the countries that I know about. So I've recently returned from Uganda, where I've seen, you know, sort of like very similar ability of the government to receive Chinese investment and to sort of use them for the sectors that they wanted to develop. So there's now a lot of Chinese investment in manufacturing, for example, and a lot of it is really owed to the president's own intervention to develop investment in, in these sectors and to attract Chinese investment in this sector. So really, like this agency takes different forms and shapes in different places, but we really see some examples of it, both in Cambodia and in some African cases. And of course, I cannot speak for the whole of Africa. I can only speak for the few countries I know about. In terms of Africa agency or host country agency where we're talking about here, our argument is also that we need to look at both sides. So the danger of drawing Africa agency or host country agency too far would imply a normative implication that uh, whatever good and bad is for Africans to blame and not for the foreign capitals. And here we're saying that there is also heterogeneity of Chinese companies. And so there are different behaviors of, of Chinese companies or foreign companies in general. 
So uh, they should also be held accountable for the developmental goals in addition to host country agency. So when we're talking about this question of host country agency and looking at comparisons with Africa, both of you have studied, again, Chinese engagement in many parts of the global South Africa specifically. And I guess I'm curious, what are the lessons that you think that Cambodia is doing right in their management of Chinese engagement for infrastructure development and even the short-term private investment? And at the same time, what are things that other countries should be aware of and learn from Cambodia for what not to do? Linda, let's start with you on that. Sure. So looking at Cambodia in particular, where they have been very good, and this is something that I've explored in a different paper where I compare Cambodia and Myanmar in the framework of the Belt and Road. So in that paper, basically, I look at how Cambodia has managed finance. And in particular, Cambodia has been extremely uh, strict about only getting either sort of free money or very, very concessional loans. They haven't taken anything, you know, that wasn't extremely concessional by their standards. So they've been really, really good at managing their macroeconomic framework and their debt. And this has been something that's been sort of done consciously over the years. And now Cambodia is in a pretty solid, you know, financial situation from that viewpoint. But Cambodia is not the only example to follow. Other countries have tried to, you know, be a lot more transparent about how they finance their infrastructure. So the same study that I mentioned also talks about Myanmar. And in Myanmar, what they have done um, under the previous government, so the National League for Democracy government, not the current government, is they have created what is called a project bank, where they list all the projects or the infrastructure projects that they need and how much they are, you know, how much um, they cost and how are they strategic and so on and so forth. And then different development partners or financiers can pitch in and say, I can contribute towards this or let's talk about this other one. So it's a much more transparent process than, you know, the sort of hard hoc negotiations that we see in many other countries. So we see a lot of positive examples of things that can be done. On the other hand, Cambodia has been a negative example exactly because of what you had mentioned of the Chinese silo. We, to be honest, African government have been looking at this for a long time and they've understood the importance of, you know, asking for increased local content through foreign investment. So they ask foreign investors to use domestic materials and to employ more people locally and so on and so forth. And this is something that they do through a set of policies. They give tax holidays or tax advantages to companies that use local materials and so on and so forth. And it's been very important, in, I think, in African countries, or at least in the ones that I've looked at in East Africa, where we used to see that companies were hiring many, many foreigners. Now the local workers are the majority, even at managerial position, even at senior position. So this sort of use of policy tools to encourage local content use in foreign investment is something where Cambodia, on the other hand, should learn from, you know, Uganda, for example. Yuan, on a kind of larger meta level, you know, as Eric mentioned, we're now 10 years into the Belt and Road Initiative. And we're also very deep into a bunch of discussions around, oh, the Belt and Road Initiative is over or slowing down or falling apart or being replaced by the Global Development Initiative. You know, th like there's a billion different versions of this conversation. So I was wondering from having now, you know, kind of engaged with it on this particular kind of local level, what is your impression of the evolution of the Belt and Road Initiative? Initiative now that it's 10 years old? Yeah, it's an interesting question. So uh, I recently came back from uh, Kenya and Ethiopia doing my field work. And of course, that's my, my home ground is still in infrastructure. So I was, also, I was observing and asking people about what's their uh, Chinese company situation there, how, how, how difficult it is to doing business. And uh, apparently one major thing is that in the past three years, the China Action Bank has not issued a single loan to them. And uh, with the uh, many uh, host countries in Africa uh, deep in debt crisis. They don't have a lot of government funding to pay Chinese company or even issue new projects. So a lot of infrastructure companies uh, or construction companies are sort of suffering. And infrastructure has been a major component of the Belt and Road. So from the company's perspective, in the past, we saw this Chinese silo in Cambodia and sort of a semi-Chinese silo, silo in many countries that uh, China, Chinese companies thrive. And there is this tab in the very beginning, that is the Chinese policy banks giving out money and then construction companies thrive and then there are subcontracting and service providers for them. So there's this whole ecosystem that uh, functions 
Um, but remember that in the beginning, it was still Chinese policy banks under the umbrella of Belt and Road or the Going Global Initiative. And now if tech is uh, getting closed, what I've seen is that these companies are forced to join uh, the, like more fierce competition between themselves and with local companies to do business. So I heard this very interesting phrase from a Chinese uh, state-owned enterprise manager that, well, in the past, if we just deal with ourselves, this looks more like a fake prosperity. Now it is a real business that we need to be like a multinational company and do business locally. So that's one change I've seen about Chinese company. Of course, in this wave, a lot of company died uh, or left, but I personally do not believe Belt and Road would die. Belt and Road is like a umbrella term for what has already been happening before and it's going to happen continuously. So it's just, uh, yeah, so activities still go on. Yeah, I just want to pick up on that that point you made about the fact that over the past three years, I think you said it was Ethiopia, that there hasn't been a new loan from the China Exim Bank in the past three years. And that's something that we're seeing in Kenya as well, where development finance went from just, I think, one or two years ago from a half a billion dollars to this year in Kenya, we're looking at $12.5 million only of development finance from the Chinese, and that's a massive drop-off. Yet here in Southeast Asia, there is a lot more ambition about building railroads down all the way to here in Ho Chi Minh City. There's the Thai-China high-speed railway. We just launched the Indonesia high-speed railway. So there's this real motivation to link China with the various countries in Southeast Asia where the BRI is still talked about in those very large, ambitious terms, multi-billion dollar terms, same in Central Asia as well. Do you see this change in the BRI spending and development finance priorities from the Chinese to focus more on the near abroad than in places like Latin America, Africa, and places much further afield? I mean, this is the million dollar or billion dollar question, right? Since we're talking about Belt and Road. Okay. Well, what are you seeing in Africa, just out of curiosity? It's very difficult, I think, to sort of uh, see, but I don't see much of, you, you know, Africa still remains a big market. Okay. Linda, what's your take on that? Uh, Latin America, I'm not so knowledgeable about, but Africa still remains a big market. So maybe we don't see the same level of, you know, sort of lending, but we still see interesting construction companies building stuff in, in Africa, Chinese construction companies, I mean. So, you know, construction companies that were building, you know, roads and, and dams uh, now find themselves getting contracts directly from the host country governments building, you know, special economic zones or infrastructure for industry and so on and so forth. I mean, the African market still needs so much in terms of construction capacity that I don't see how, you know, these companies are going to disappear. Now, maybe the, the funding through which these companies are paid will be different. But I still think there's a huge gap that needs to be filled and these companies are there to, you know, and, and they actually like, you know, are very successful in what they're doing. So I don't see how that's going to stop in the coming years. Yuan, over the last while in China, there's been a lot of concern about the impacts of the gambling network in Southeast Asia, um, particularly around human trafficking. And as we know, the Belt and Road isn't just about capital flow and, and investment. It's also about policy integration and cooperation around things like policing. So I was wondering if you're seeing an increase in that kind of cooperation. In, in Africa, we've seen similar kind of joint operations, but on a limited level. And um, so I was wondering if on the Southeast Asia side, there's a closer co coordination between the governments around these kind of issues around policing, for example? Yeah, in fact, in Africa, my own research in Angola did indicate that back in the 2014 or sometime, if I remember correctly, there were joint police cooperation to hunt down certain individuals. But whether that is carried out or if there is potential to carry out that in a larger scale, as we see in Cambodia, I'm not very sure because we do see a lot of gambling industry or other gray areas in Cambodia. There are some in Africa, but I'm not familiar with the gambling industry in Africa, but I'm not aware of anywhere in Africa similar to the scale of Chinese presence in the gambling industry at Seattle or um, Philippines or 
uh, Myanmar. So the need of that is still not yet as much as we saw in, in Cambodia these days. But yeah, we've already seen incidences of that happening in oil-rich countries like Angola with a lot of barn. The article is Chinese Capital, Regulatory Strength, and the BRI, A Tale of Fractured Development in Cambodia. It was published last month in the academic journal World Development by Yuan Wang, who is an assistant professor of international relations at Duke Quinshan University. That's in China's Jiangsu province, right outside of Shanghai. Beautiful campus there. And also Linda Calabrese, who is a research fellow in the International Development Program at the Overseas Development Institute in London. Linda, Yuan, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. These cross-continental comparisons are absolutely fascinating. The paper is absolutely fascinating. We're going to put a link to the article in the show notes. And I just want to thank you for both joining us on the show to tell us all about your research. Thank you very much. Thanks, Eric and Cobus, for hosting us. Thank you for having us. Cobus, throughout our discussion with Linda and Yuan about this, really a fascinating paper, and I hope people take the time to look at it, because I think by looking at what's going on in places like Cambodia, it can draw a lot of lessons and warnings for other countries. And you can see some very interesting parallels with what we've been focusing on all these years in Africa. But throughout the discussion, I kept thinking of the research by Oxford University scholar Folashade Sule, who talked about even within a single country, there were huge variations in the quality of the governance and negotiation with the Chinese. And that discrepancy led to very different outcomes. And it seems to be the same case in Cambodia as well, where if you have competent negotiators and competent regulators and effective governance, you get a better deal. And if you have corrupt, less effective and unprofessional negotiators or inexperienced negotiators, you get a worse deal. And this brings me back to the point that we've mentioned over and over again on the show about the need for both effective governance, but also high levels of China literacy in order to effectively negotiate with the Chinese. Absolutely. And I think what comes with that then is also a a certain level of knowledge about different kinds of Chinese capital, different kinds of Chinese actors. Because obviously, like part of the problem in Sianukville is that so much of that capital is not only flowing into the gambling industry, but it's coming from the kind of capital that wants to invest in the gambling industry. Um, You know, so so in that sense, it kind of pre-selects for a certain number of problems, which you don't necessarily get in the construction side. That said, in the African case, there's sometimes plenty of problems, and in Southeast Asia, sometimes plenty of problems in the construction side too. And there, you know, so so the interaction between host government regulation, the level of kind of human capital in those departments, how free they are to work, how protected they are from pressures in the government, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, then play in complicated ways with the specific kinds of Chinese actors that are entering entering the space. You know, so it's a very complicated landscape, I think. Yeah, and I thought Yuan's comments about the lack of regulation on the Chinese side was so interesting, how the fact is that a lot of Chinese embassies and consulates simply don't have the personnel to monitor the volume of Chinese business activities that are going on in a particular country, especially in a place like Sihanoukville, where, you know, if you haven't been to Sihanoukville, from what I hear, and I've been to Phnom Penh a number of times, but I haven't been to Sihanoukville, but from what I hear, Sihanoukville is a little bit like Las Vegas in the 1970s where anything goes, it is rife with organized crime. It is a place that's trying to build its way out of it and mature out of it. But right now, there are parts of it which, from what I hear, are quite seedy. And so the idea that the Chinese embassy would somehow be able to regulate that just isn't possible. And that's, I think, a question that a lot of people have in terms of managing Chinese companies abroad. We've talked about this in places like Ghana and the DRC, where Chinese illegal mining enterprises are active. And can't the Chinese do something in places where there's weak governance? And the fact is that no government can monitor all of its activities of its corporate stakeholders abroad simply because foreign services and embassies simply don't have the staff or even the regulatory power to do that. And so I really wonder what can be done about these questions if the host government fails and falls through and doesn't come through with effective governance. That, that's just an interesting question to think about. Absolutely. I mean, it also then shows how, you know, kind of like a lot of the kind of assumptions around the Belt and Road Initiative that one sees, for example, in, you know, frequently repeated in by American stakeholders, 
is this idea of the, this very, very strong party state that's deploying their companies around the world to serve Chinese foreign policy interests. Where in reality, you know, as, as this shows, it's chaos frequently. And like, and, and the, you know, the, the diplomats or the government officials don't necessarily have that much more control over it than anyone else. You know, it's, it's much more of a setting of a big idea and then a lot of chaotic actors kind of following in its wake, some, you know, in, in better ways than others, I think. I want to quickly pivot before we leave. And last time we did a show that was almost an hour and 20 minutes, and we can't do that again or else our audience is just going to leave us. But uh, I just really want to get your take on this announcement that came out of the G20 for this mega infrastructure project from India connecting through the Persian Gulf, up through Saudi Arabia, all the way through Israel, and then to Greece, which is the gateway to Europe. This massive infrastructure corridor that they're going to build this transport corridor is what they call it green hydrogen they said they're going to transport on it they're going to put data lines on it and i got a bunch of messages from various people in the u.s government saying see we're doing it (laughs) because they know how skeptical i've been over the years and i'm just thinking to myself when have we ever seen an infrastructure project on a scale like this that transcends Asia, the Middle East, Europe, with something like 14 countries, how is this ever going to get done? There's never been an infrastructure project like this. And so I'm not saying it's not possible. I'm just saying I worry that it's too ambitious, it's too big, it's too complicated. Therefore, it won't ever actually happen. That was my gut reaction to it. It's just how could you ever pull something like this off, you know, to be anywhere even 5% of the scale of what they're talking about? What was your reaction to this whole massive corridor? And again, they're not saying directly that this is a competition with the BRI, but you and I, we both know that's exactly what this thing is. Well, yeah, I mean, it it certainly looks inspired by the BRI. I mean, you know, partly also as, you know, kind of in in its, in in the flair of the big announcement, and then it mostly at the moment, obviously, these are very early days, but, you know, as as with the early BRI, it, it mostly lived as a series of maps, you know, that were then kind of sent around the internet. One would then have to see how how that lands on the ground. One of the things that I was a little unsure about is what it's supposed to do. Because, of course, you know, like, if one takes for a moment, for the sake of argument, if one takes the BRI as this idea of, you know, an orchestrated, you know, plan to use infrastructure to... XXX, you know, like, what, what that, that too is, in, in the end, in the logic of the BRI, is to connect other parts of the world to China. In this sense, I'm not exactly sure what the connection is supposed to do. And from what I what I read, and I need to read more about it, but like from a read, what I read so far is it seems to be ensuring the production of things like green hydrogen in certain places and then for export to Europe, I assume. But the thing is, the BRI got so far, as, as far as it did, by playing into the development needs of host governments as well. So I'd be very interested to see what the thinking is in relation to the different host governments and different other partners, non-Western partners involved, and you know, kind of what the kind of calculations are on their side and what they expect to win from it. And you also have to think about what is the organizing body that's going to coordinate all of this. So the Chinese have the Chinese Communist Party, right? I mean, they, in many ways, drove this, the BRI, and the Chinese government as well. But a lot of this was from Xi Jinping. She said, we're going to do this. Everybody goes, whoop, we're doing it. Okay, that's an organizing principle. Flim-flammy as it is, and that's what led to a lot of malfeasance and poor spending and poor decisions and boondoggles like the Port of Ambandota, but at least there was some type of organizing body that was there. Who is going to be that linkage between India, the United Arab Emirates, the Saudis, the Israelis, the Greeks, I mean, all these countries that are involved in this? Who's going to bring them together? Who's going to project manage it? Who's going to coordinate it? I know these are very retentive questions, but Again, I can't think of another example of a project like this that has been done. This is almost on the scale of the Marshall Plan back, you know, in the post-World War II era. 
And I can't see that the United States has the legitimacy nor the cash to do this. It doesn't have the skills either, as much as it says it wants to. I, that's the part that I just can't get my head around. I'm worried a little bit that the United States loves these big announcements, but has a difficulty in actually following through. And that's what we saw with Build Back Better World. PGII is still a TBD, to be honest with you. That's the Partnership for Global Infrastructure Investment. There's a lot of talk. There's a lot of little initiatives, but nothing really serious. In fact, the big one is the Libido Corridor for $250 million. And honestly, you know, that's taken eight months to get this thing going. And so I'm not, in, I don't know, if I was an investor, I don't know if I would put my money behind this project. Speaking of which, by the way, a report came out last week as well that the coalition or the consortium that is organizing the Lubido Corridor has been going out to mining companies and saying, are you interested in signing up to have your materials from the cobalt and copper from Zambia and the DRC shipped to the Lubido Corridor via the railway? And only one has signed up. Everybody else has said no, or at least has said we're going to wait, and that's Ivanhoe Mines from Canada. So it's a hard sell that they're running into. This isn't easy stuff. And I just, on a scale this big, that's the one thing that makes me wonder whether this will ever happen. And let's not forget, Joe Biden only has, what are we now, 2023, January 2025 is his last day in office. He's neck and neck with Donald Trump right now. So there's no guarantee that the Americans can bring any continuity to their policy in a Trump administration should that happen. So again, a lot of big questions out there. Give them credit for the ambition. The execution is going to be super hard. You know, the fact that, that there's been no details around the financing of it. I think once once those emerge, then, then we'll know more. But the thing is, we're literally days out of the African climate summit where there they've been making a lot of points that you know the un fcc people have, have been saying for a long time that we need about a hundred billion dollars of, of investment per year to really significantly move towards any kind of climate solution you know like if we can't kind of like generate the capital for something that's so starkly existential as that then where's the money going to come from? I mean, maybe there may well be sources. I mean, you know, kind of, you know, many people pay for many things and may they may well have a fantastic plan. But so far, we haven't seen the plan. So it'll be very interesting to see the plan, I think. Well, the only difference here is that the Emiratis, who are sitting on a trillion dollars of natural gas, and the Saudis, who are, you know, richer than everybody else in the world, they actually have the cash to pay for this if they want. I'm not entirely convinced that they necessarily want to pay for the whole thing going up into Europe, but... Certainly the money is from the Saudis and the Emiratis and some of the Gulf states that are energy rich. But again, one has to wonder then, what's the role of the U.S. then if the Saudis can do this on their own? I don't know. I mean, so again, a lot of questions. It was a little bit like the $55 billion number that they rolled out at the U.S. Africa Leaders Summit, and they didn't give a lot of specifics as to where this came from. So there's a little bit of a pattern here that the Americans like to make these big announcements without details or plans and say, we'll figure it out as we go. But it takes months and months and months to figure it out. And as what we're hearing from the Lobito Corridor, I mean, that thing was announced back, what, in May? I think, you know, and we're now almost October. Again, we should have a plan in place. We should see some details if you want to have the confidence that people are going to sign up for these things. And clearly, from what we're seeing, the consortium struggling to sign up potential shippers on that rail line shows you that they're having a little bit of, of a marketing problem. So, so I think some advice for our folks who listen to us from the State Department and the U.S. government that releasing plans on these things would actually, I think, help you a lot in getting traction behind it. So wish you the best of luck. Call me skeptical, but then again, I'm skeptical of a lot of these things. So uh, let's go ahead and leave the conversation there. We want to get out of here before an hour. I want to thank uh, everybody for their support who've been subscribing to our newsletter and to our service. We can't tell you how much we appreciate it. If you'd like to join our growing community of readers around the world, go to chinaglobalsouth.com slash subscribe. You'll get 30 days for free. All the amazing journalism that Kobus, Njenga, Johnny, Antonia, we have a team of about 10 people in Asia, Africa, and the Middle East who are putting together this amazing newsletter every day, and we're growing. We have some new folks joining us by the end of the year. 
covering climate and more out here in Asia. So we would love for you to be able to join folks in about 25 different governments around the world. Subscribe to us and read us every day. Corporations, investors, civil society, lots of scholars. So it's a great community of readers. We'd love to have you a part of it. Once again, chinaglobalsouth.com slash subscribe. If you are a student or a teacher, just email me, eric at chinaglobalsouth.com, and I'll send you links for half off. Uh, subscription, so it's a great deal. So let's leave it there. For Kobus van Staden in Berlin, I'm Eric Olander in Ho Chi Minh City. We'll be back again next week with another edition of the China Global South podcast. Until then, thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Follow the China Global South project on Twitter at China GS Project and share your thoughts on today's show or head over to our website at chinaglobalsouth.com where you can subscribe to receive full access to more than 5,000 articles and podcasts. Once again, that's chinaglobalsouth.com.